episode six and a half. It is. It 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 was seen popping bottles. It, do the step. We can do it all by ourselves. These bottles that he popped was a. Uh, it was an, it was a zero sugar ale. Yes, not we're not we're not at the club. No. We're not getting crunk. Everybody in the club getting frisky. I can tell you that much. But that's not. Unfortunately, we're not there, so we, no. we're not participating in that. No, shit. we are not. No, we are not. But welcome to episode sixty nine. We're gonna get fucking nasty today. We're gonna get we're gonna get gross. There's gonna be there's gonna be drips going everywhere. And I don't mean no outfit neither with the drip. No. You know, no, look at us. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, it's. I mean, you're always wearing your your running things. Yes, because I got it for free from doing the race. Yeah, which is arguably I paid for the we, race. But we also we also got the shirt for free from. Uh, oh my god, why am I blanking? Why am I blanking? Uh oh, I'm too. Oh wow, we're real bad at having uh, having uh, one time sponsors. Yeah. Yeah. That's okay. Their sponsorship with us is over. It's a whole thing. They sent us clothes. It was pretty cool. Uh, none of them fit you. <laughs> no, they sent. <laughs> they, they sent us. Uh, I mean, it was part. I'm going to blame their application form, which yeah. which was uh, it, fill this out, but it only gave fill out for what like one person. Yeah, one comment. size. We so. put it in in the notes like, hey, we also need another one that's a smaller size. I'm not going to blame the poor warehouse worker who was yeah, probably just fair. told, do this. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. I'll Into the that. AM. Into the AM, of course. Of course. High quality stuff. How they recommend. They don't sponsor us anymore. Nope. It was a one-time thing. It was a one-time video on TikTok. But the shirts are pretty cool. Um, unrelated entirely. Welcome to episode 69 of the Duels and Mana Dorks podcast. I'm Connor. And I'm Sam. And we are the Dungeon Bros, but we are not brothers. Nor are we in a dungeon. And we're going to get exactly the same as we always are for the podcast probably yeah we were wanting to do something special um i'm tired and i got a bachelor party this weekend so i'm saving my debauchery for then that's fair personally we're very excited we're going to pigeon forge pigeon forge yeah by the time this is by the time this is posted for the free feeds it will have already happened yes the debauchery will have concluded at that point so pigeon forge you know not even not even that long ago was just a podunk little town it's still and cabin. and now it's a destination cabin in the area. It's a cabin destination. Like you're not going yeah, to Pigeon Forge, Pigeon Forge per se. Of, yeah, it's full of uh, tchotchkes and it is. And yeah, it's a whole thing. It's a whole thing. Uh, for well, well, we'll get into some. We'll get into the normal housekeeping stuff. Um, we don't talk about sponsors at this point because I add the ad in later, mm-hmm. which you can get the podcast early and ad free on our Patreon, patreoncom slash the Dungeon Bros, five dollars gives you early ad-free access. Fifteen dollars get your name right at the end of the show. You can join for free on the Patreon to get questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, and/or ideas right in for the show. We post a thread. Uh, the of, we record usually on Tuesday, Wednesday. I post it on the Friday before. You got the whole weekend to to put in submissions and stuff. It's yeah. a whole wonderful thing. You should check it out. Patreon.com/slash The Dungeon Bros. We're going to be in Gen Con. Yes, we are. Which will be very fun. That's uh, uh, all, a all little over a month away. Oh God. Oh, God. It's very close. I'm very excited. Have you signed up for, for activities? No. I signed up for um, for the Crit Awards. Sure. Which yes. we had we had the CEO of the Crit Awards on Ooh, Ivy. Segway. Yeah, it was a, it was rather chaotic. It wasn't that was a segue. That was a segue. And I don't mean no I don't mean no motorized two wheel scooter with a handlebar on it neither. Because we're not fucking dorks. We're, we're not I'm not Paul Blart, okay? The old, you know the old Paul Blart mall cop mm-hmm. reference. I do for those that it's been a while know. since I it's a uh, about uh, Kevin James classic. I think there was three of them. There were three of those movies. Should there, it w- should there have been? The first one was the first one. It was a it was a twenty aughts uh, comedy. It was with Kevin James in it. It wasn't Grown Ups, is all I'm saying. It was not Grown Ups. And you can take that for whatever it might mean. But we did talk to Ivy of of the Crit Awards. She's the CEO there on a previous ep- episode of Bonus Action. Two episodes, actually. Episode 4 and Episode 5. Both of which are out now. Uh, you can get the Bonus Actions also early on the Patreon. Uh, upcoming, 
on what was that june 26th for patreon members we're going to have typical gemini we're going to talk about magic the gathering mm -hmm. and stuff may uh, most likely a recurring guest to yeah. talk about sets and such as they release and yeah all we that. went into a lot of uh modern horizons and then a little bit of you know game theory about yeah. deck building and it was great it was a good time a very good conversation if you're into magic the gathering that'll be available on july 1st the following monday for all the free feeds as well so you don't miss out on that we also have a third one that we haven't recorded yet so i don't want to we'll not spoil it. it it's not be in surprised. It's not in the tank yet. Once it's in the tank, I'm comfortable with talking about it. But before it's in the tank, I don't want to, I don't want to put anyone out there. Nope. You know, it's a whole thing. Anyway, that's the that's the normal spiel. Now we're just gonna ramble for a little bit. What, have you been you've been playing Slay the Spire recently a lot? Yeah. So I was watching uh, Loading Ready Run, mm -hmm. and they were doing a. They were like, oh, well, for this for this Friday night paper fight. Uh, you know, we're we're getting ready to play the Sp Slay the Spire board game, which just came out, mm -hmm. uh, and so we have the biggest Sp Slay the Spire creator here, and we're gonna force him to play Magic with us. And I was like, as you do. I was like, I've heard of Slay the Spire. I wonder why. And I looked. It's like, oh, I have it. For, I have it. I own it. Yeah. Uh, and so I downloaded it. It's a fun little game. Yeah, it's the PlayStation Plus freebies. Yes. I assume they're so, not free. You're paying for them still, but it's a whole. But it's uh, yeah, it's a roguelike deck builder. Mm -hmm. Um. You know, very equivalent to any uh, uh, TCG style gameplay. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's it's very it's very straightforward, and I've been enjoying that a That's lot. I wasn't nice. expecting to. No, not at all. That's fun. Um, I I recently finished like my ten thousandth playthrough of Persona Five: The Royal, mm -hmm. which was wonderful. I got the platinum again. There you go. I now have it twice. I lot. wish I I wish I could buy it again and get it a third time. That game is phenomenal. Uh, working through the DLC of Final Fantasy VII Remake mm -hmm. right now, the Yuffie DLC. I got sidetracked by the Fort Condor mini game because that's a fun little mini game, and I hear that uh, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, the second one, has has like a card mini game thing that people are losing themselves to a lot. So that might be the next two hundred hours of my life. Sure. Also got the upcoming Persona 3 Reload DLC, and I I did the Final Fantasy 16 Rising Tide DLC, which added like Leviathan and all that kind of stuff. It was really cool. Final Fantasy 16 is a fucking crazy cool world, and I've been I've daydreamed about um about a a D and D or TTRPG like campaign setting mm -hmm. in Valisthea, just because like the lore in that game is so deep and rich, like you have all of that like built in. Sure, I would love to do it myself, but um, it's a licensed property, so you know, you know how it is. I mean, you can always you know do your homebrew stuff okay. and just for your own game. It, it would be fun. It would be fun. Get all the weebs you know. Exactly. There's there's a lot of those in the world. There are. And I know quite a few of them as and well. And the overlap between Weeb and D&D &D is... Not quite a circle, but pretty... Pretty, pretty heavy. It's a very fat infinity sign. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like a weird looking egg. It's a very, it's a very weird looking egg. Um, speaking of D&D, &D, we have been playing in a D&D &D game. As of the recording of this, we're going to be playing again tomorrow. Yeah. It's like Bloodborne and Dark Souls inspired, and it's EXP leveling. Yes. With but a, not with a just, twist. But not just four levels. Mm -hmm. The, the DM is also giving us opportunities to use these for upgrades to weapons and, and other purchasing mechanics. Like feats and items mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff. In, interesting ways of evolving a character using XP as like a resource as opposed to just like a number milestone you hit to get a level. You still We're still having to expend experience to gain a level. Um, but we also are like capped at what level we can be at any point in the campaign. So it's not like anyone's going to like rush up a whole bunch of levels and be yeah. a higher level than everyone else in the party. And and they've also, I mean, they've been thinking about this for a while and, and have been evolving this, this uh, upgrade system that they've been using. Uh, and so it's not necessarily, oh, I want to get to the next level because that's the only thing, you know, to, that that's going to buff me up. The upgrades they've got are pretty good. Very good. Um, I've, we we started the the first session. We had a dragon fight. Yeah. Because of course we did. We this are is, starting at level uh, eight nine. Uh, what are we? Eight. At? eight. We're at level eight. Level eight. Um. 
You're full wizard? Sorcerer. Sorcerer. You're full sorcerer. I'm five fighter with three in barbarian, totem of the bear. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm an ASMR. It's a fun time. Wonderful time. I like a marshal. This is the first time I've done like a pure marshal as well. Because I usually do like, I like a half caster, like a hex blade yeah. or, or a ranger or something. I, the, I've only done, I think one pure marshal as well. And we only got to level three. Mm -hmm. So, well, no, we got two level three. We never played as level three characters. That is true. That is true. Um, but I'm doing like battle master, battle master stuff. So I got all the maneuvers, and uh, I got like a, a little weapon upgrade thing. Mm -hmm. So I've got like interesting things I can do with my greatsword now. It's pretty cool. But yeah, exp advanced exp based leveling. I feel like that would be a fun little homebrew we could we could slap together pretty yeah. easily. Do a video on that kind of stuff. We'll see if that ever happens. I don't know, but <laughs> just but. steal their stuff. <laughs> let's get in. Let's get into the podcast. We got some meat today. We're talking about uh, Assassin's Creed MTG. Sam is much more excited about it than I am. I think, and he's have, more the have, Assassin's Creed have, person. Yes, I have things to say about it. Um, sorry, the cat is having a little panic attack off the camera. Yeah, that, that's what the cat. Yes, does. I am. I am. We'll get into it in a second, but. I hope that was picked up on on the microphone because she totally just th it sounded like she fell off of something and she thudded did, yeah. and then ran away. Uh, <laughs> and we have a lot of new information about the revised fifth edition books and more info is going to be coming out after we record this and before it goes to free feeds. So, you know, this is the most accurate information as of the recording of this, and there's a lot of cool stuff. And then we're going to wrap up with some Tularean Community College stuff, some Hatsune Miku, and answer questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, and or ideas from the audience. You can get the Duels of Mandorks podcast every other week. We record it live on TikTok as well as uh, for patrons one week early on Wednesdays. Then the following Monday, it goes live for free feeds every other week. Can fall, you can get you can listen to us anywhere you know yeah and all of the places Apple Google Spotify YouTube music YouTube for the video as well as on Patreon for the video yeah sure. if you're doing any of those uh, do the free things like subscribe yes put us on mute in the background put us on mute in the background and just let us autoplay pull up the Duels of Manadorks playlist on YouTube and just let it play in the background you got so many hours yeah oh so many hours of content I was going to say quality content but yeah it's <laughs> Content I, um, from the past content. three years. Content <laughs> of the past three years. So let's get into the rundown of all the upcoming releases as we do every episode. Samuel, what do we got? All right. So starting out in the Dungeons and Dragons world, we have the making of original D&D. &D. It is this thick uh, history thick. book about D&D, &D, 1970, 1976. It is out now. Inexpensive. It's $100 on Amazon. It's Amazon, way too much. Amazon is also under the impression that it is a regular D&D &D book that you can play with. Yeah, it that's funny. That's fun. I can't wait to get it at Ollie's for $15 in a couple months. Oh, yeah. That'd be great. Uh, <laughs> next the last adventure or the last book being put out for the 2014 revision of D and D, uh, the quest from the infinite staircase. This is the anthology book for this year. It'll be available for on D and D beyond and at your local game stores on July 9th with the full release one week later on July 16th, just about a month away. Very exciting. That, it's nice the, to know that that will also be compatible with the upcoming revision. Yes. I'm trying to be better about saying revised fifth edition as opposed to one D and D. <laughs> personally but and and that's a, that was a big thing that they're trying to do with one the revised edition is to make sure all of your adventures are playable Absolutely. and your characters we'll get talking about this a little more in a second but your characters from 2014 are playable with 2024 absolutely uh that being said the 2024 revision of dungeons and dragons uh the player's handbook will be coming out on september 17th of this year the Dungeon Master's Guide on November 12th, and the Monster Manual will be available on February 18th of next year. Uh, I believe those are full releases. Yes, those with, are the full releases. Uh, two week earlier on each four. For D&D uh, &D Beyond and... Uh, yeah, for digital and game store. Yes, yes. Uh, and that you can get them bundled as well. If you get the digital and physical bundled together, it's cheaper. We'll get into that later. Yeah. Uh, in the Magic the Gathering world, we have Modern Horizons 3. That is out now. Now. Very, right now. very now. Uh, still shockingly um, worth the money. Yeah, you've cla cracked quite a fruit. You have bleh, bleh, cracked bleh, bleh, bleh. quite a few packs. Yes. Since words are hard. You since, say words better. I dare you. Since oh. our uh, pre-release kits, and you've yes. gotten some good stuff. Dude, the, the wall, I'm telling you right now, the Walmart Magic the Gathering packs are busted. 
beyond all imagining. Walmart has the heat. They do have the heat. I pulled uh, I pulled a Mana Crypt from Lost Caverns of Ixalan pack that I got at Walmart, and I got two Tamios. Yeah. In addition to like a whole bunch of other stuff that's Emmercool. still fair. I got an Emrakul. Another Emrakul? No, did I get... No, I got a Kozilek. Kozilek. I got that's a Kozilek, it, yeah. that one. So... Yeah, Modern Horizons 3 is good, and the best part, the best part, all of the cracked commons are, like, less than 50 cents Oh, each. yeah. And most of the very good uncommons are less than a dollar. And you can, and the uncommons go up to $5 for, like, the very top end. There's a lot of good rares that are less than $5. The car, the specific cards themselves, if you dive into that set, there is a lot There's of very good so stuff. much value. Very good, very good. Value! Value! Uh, next up is the Assassin's Creed Universes Beyond set that will be coming out July 5th. We'll talk about that more here in just one moment. Uh, going forward, uh, we have Bloomboro being pre-released on July 26th with full release on August 2nd. We will be at Gen Con during the full release. Yes, that'll be very fun. A lot of fun pre-con events at Gen Con for Bloomboro. And then finally, we have Duskmorn House of Horrors. That'll be available in Q4 of this year. Before we get back to the rest of this podcast clip from the Duels and Mandorks podcast, we want to thank our sponsor, ProxyForge. ProxyForge creates high-quality Magic the Gathering proxies for you to use in your commander decks and really anywhere you want. You can get custom Magic the Gathering packs that include CEDH staples as well as monocolor commander staples, cycles of expensive cards like Tutors and the Swords. You can also get upgrade packs for commander precons that include 10 cards to soup up your favorite precon. If all you want is a very simple mana base, you can get any of the cycles of lands as well as lands organized by color pairing. And that's not to say anything about the custom art soul rings you can acquire, as well as the plethora of singles available to you. Use the link in the description below to help us out and check out Proxy Forge to help bling out your board state. Let's flash back to the Assassin's Creed stuff. So... We've we've talked about the Beyond Booster a lot. Yes. It's not a it's not a regular release. There aren't any pre constructed commander decks, which I find astounding personally. Yeah, this cat. Is... Cat, why why are you a menace today? Lay down and be comfortable. She's like it's the 69th episode. I have to be a menace. Of course she does. Of course yeah, she does. Uh, of course this set was supposed to be one in the aftermath style mm -hmm. and like they're everybody was kind of suspecting oh this will be what these mini beyond or universes beyond sets were going to be like going forward uh this one's just the one that they couldn't salvage it, it was like yeah they they were convinced that aftermath was going to be a good idea and when it wasn't they were like oh we we don't have time to expand Assassin's Creed into a full set, so we're just going to call them Beyond Boosters now and add a card or two and hope nobody notices. Yeah. So They thought it was going to be the move, and it clearly wasn't. As the, the children say, they thought they ate. They th Do the children say that? I think so. I watch TikTok. So at the time of, at the time of right now... A Beyond Booster Box is going to be around $130. Uh, a Play Booster Box of like Outlaws of Thunder Junction is currently $145, so it's a slightly less, but you're going to get way more cards with a regular Booster Box. Um, the major mechanic for Assassin's Creed, there's really only one. Yes. And that's free running. Free running is very fun. What's, what's, what's that about? Free running. Uh, so free running says you can cast this spell as its free running cost, which is usually a reduced cost, if you've dealt combat damage to an opponent with either an assassin or your commander this turn. The the assassin... Dealing damage with an assassin would have been a very strict restriction. Mm -hmm. But the fact that you can also get that reduced cost if you attack with and deal damage with your commander makes these cards much, much more valuable. Particularly because there are a lot of good instants and sorceries and other kinds of cards. Sorry. Oh, feline... I'm back. Menace to, menace to society, the cat. Sorry. There's buddy. a lot. There's a lot of good instants and sorceries that have good, powerful effects that are fair costed. Yeah, they're for pretty their, on rate. They're on rate, and then the reduced cost if you happen to have dealt damage with your commander mm -hmm. or an assassin. There's a lot of incidental assassins that go well in decks. Then you get a much, much better rate and get way more value out of those cards. So I think there's specific individual ones that are going to be way more 
that are going to be very valuable if you do happen to open up this set. Uh, the other interesting thing, we are going to get some historical figure treatments that have serialized printings. So you can play with uh, your 69 of whatever Cleopatra, which will be interesting. Or you can have Leonardo da Vinci wrestle a grizzly bear. Yeah. As you, as you all... <laughs> As everyone knows, Leonardo da Vinci could totally beat up a fucking brown bear for yeah, some he, reason. I mean, he was the first real, you know, bodybuilder, fucking uh, uh, primal. He was, he was building bodies. That's for that's for damn sure. I've seen the Vesuvian Man. Yeah, that is true. Uh, you also are going to get a special treatment for these universes beyond with the Memory Corridor Showcase. It's going to feature twelve iconic characters from the Assassin's Creed games in sort of an animus style, like digital weird looking thing kind of the it's the loading screen from the games is that did is that corridor that memory corridor effectively and there is one scene set of cards that includes Ezio, uh the five color Ezio with the free running for black black and uh one of each of the allied pain lands and like a full art uh you can put them together to create a scene much like they did with lord of the rings called the roma vista the roma vista or the view of rome I it's believe. it's pretty cool to have a a reprint of the um of the pain lands mm-hmm. which would be nice whether or not that makes the set worth buying i imagine it won't because these play bo- the uh the play boosters Usually cost like four dollars, five dollars, depending. Yeah, these Beyond boosters I think are priced at like seven. Right. Modern Modern Horizons right now is priced at like ten, which is yeah. way more. But the cards are way more valuable, so it's gonna be. I'm I'm intrigued to see where the cards in this set like end up priced out, and that'll really kind of determine whether this set is worth it or not. I will say the asterisk to that: you are getting starter decks. Yes. The starter deck boxes for most all of these sets is super valuable. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of times people don't buy them in the first place, but they have some very good cards in them. Mm-hmm. And for twenty dollars, that's probably the best rate you're going to get on cards, especially because there are exclusive cards for yeah. the starter decks as well. Um, in Lord of the Rings, it was Aragorn and Arwen wed, and then Sauron, the lidless eye, the lidless eye, and there were several exclusive cards to those that weren't super powerful, but you were getting a very fair value and uh, up. Coming in Bloomboro as well, the starter deck is going to have the Bria Riptide. Yes, that's right. You're very excited. So that card's going to be super valuable and for a solid $20. It always seems like the starter decks are like locked in at that price, it seems, for some reason. Um, Probably because people don't fucking buy them. (laughs) But that might be your best entry point for Assassin's Creed if you're like kind of interested, but you don't want to spend a lot of money for like 10 cards. Right. Because... What would it, Twenty-one dollars is going to be three boosters, which would give you twenty-one cards. Yeah, I believe it's right. Uh, and the bundle too is also right on rate for about a dollar a card. Yeah, which I doubt that these cards are going to be worth more, averaging worth more than a dollar. Just wait. Just wait a couple of months. Just wait, and it'll go down in price. Absolutely. The, I am. At, I would. I would love for this set to go the way of aftermath, where you can get a box for forty dollars, and even though the aftermath box still isn't monetarily worth it at $40 a pop. The cards within for $40 a a box, like you're getting a fair enough value Mm -hmm. in that, I would say, because there are a lot of very playable cards in Aftermath. Oh, yeah. Uh, But we're going to look at some of the cards that have been spoiled. We are immediately done with Modern Horizons 3 as of the full release. And we're full into spoilers for Assassin's Creed for some fucking reason. And we're going to be full on into spoilers for Bloomborough right when the Assassin's Creed releases. It's great, he said sarcastically. Here's what I will say. (laughs) I enjoy watching about Modern Horizons 3. I enjoy watching a, a gameplay show. You know, there's plenty of them out there. And so many of them have all done their Modern Horizons 3 Mm pre-con, and sometimes it's like two or three episodes of that. So I'm really tired of seeing Ulalek versus Dissa versus Oma versus uh, Satya. But there's a lot there's a lot of good and I think that's kind of just on the content creators being either a little bit lazy and hot take either being a little bit lazy or wizards providing them with the deck and being like you need to play with the deck this many times. Yeah. You know? I mean the wizards definitely wanted to push this uh the Modern Horizons 3 set. Good reason. There's a lot of great cards. I I've loved seeing how people have been figuring out and busting wide open Nadu. <laughs> 
Nadu's Cracked Beyond All Belief. There's a lot of really cool um, uncommon cards that you can use for PDH decks that I'm very excited for. And let alone the commons. There's that. There's the uh, it's stupid. There's it's the, ridiculous. Was it Rising Chrysalid? Two red green, and it's it, tw- ten years ago. It would have been a myth, uh, ten years ago. It would have been a mythic rare. Yeah, yeah. It's it's unbelievable. And I mean, Cranial Ram being banned before it's even really. The cards are very good. We're big fans. So moving back to Assassin's Creed, we keep, we keep moving away from Assassin's Creed, and I All feel right. like that's indicative of something, but I don't know what it is. We've got uh, some pre-release cards. These are accurate as of what is this? The 18th, 19th, yes. the 19th of June when we're recording this. Uh, it will be posted later to gay today. <laughs> today to gay it is Pride Month. Today, Pride, Pride <laughs> shout out to the gays. Happy episode 69 for Pride Month. That's perfect. Oh, amazing. That's perfect. Uh, <laughs> but this is accurate as of June 19th. Uh, we don't usually go through all of the cards in a set in these kinds of set overviews as spoiler season is happening. But do you have anything you want to you want to pick out immediately here? Well, first, I want to talk about. So they've kind of grouped um, different sets of assassins into different color combinations. Uh, so Naya has the uh, ones from the Viking game um, Valhalla. Uh, and those will deal a lot with sagas and with lands. Then there's the Boros, um, which is from some of the older game or from like uh, uh, Odyssey and Origins. Those ones deal with historic permanence. Then there's the Grixis set, usually dealing with the pirates and uh, the boats. Um, other than that, I'm not sure about too many of the others. But yeah, um, I want to. I've got one to start with. Go ahead. Which is. An un, one of the uncommons, which, by the way, because these are beyond boosters, there are no commons. So the uncommons are now just common. Uh, the Assassin Initiate is a one mana, one, one human assassin. You can pay one mana of any color, and then Assassin Initiate, Initiate gains your choice of flying, death touch, or lifelink until the end of turn. This is very efficient pseudo evasion. Because even though it's a one, one with nothing... If you just swing with a 1-1 with nothing at someone, they need to be like, okay, how much mana does this person have open? Mm-hmm. Are they going Are they going to spend it to, is this a bluff? Are they wanting me to block and then going to give it death touch? Are they are they swinging in and then before blockers giving it flying? Like, if, if you hold up the assassin initiate to chump block a big threat in the air, they might swing into you, not realizing oh they can just pay a mana and then give this thing flying and yeah. then they've chump blocked your big threat uh lifelink just kind of like i feel like lifelink is just the alternative when you're swinging in and you're holding up a mana to make it death touch to try and take something out yeah and if they don't block then you can just pay one and give it lifelink to incidentally gain a life if yeah. that or hold up mana for something else i think it's very efficient as a one mana one one that's going to let you play a little bit of mind games with your opponent which i'm a big fan of love an efficient one mana one one mm-hmm. uh, so, uh let's talk about smoke bomb so this is an artifact for three mana it has flash it gives all creatures shroud all creatures have shroud that's your all. opponents yours everything so uh and then at the beginning of your upkeep sacrifice smoke bomb when you do target creature control can't be blocked this turn this is another mind game thing so your opponent you know especially if they're trying to equip or they're trying to or or you're trying to destroy something you have three mana to mess up a game plan is not only just for just for that thing for the entire turn cycle mm-hmm. until your upkeep that's not bad not and bad. on an artifact since artifacts are easy to uh uh get the effect or like uh f- cost reduce there we go god cost reduce return from the graveyard there's so much there's so many ways to do that uh or you can't uh, or bounce it back to your hand anything this is very reasonable at three mana i in terms of the mind games i can also see someone casting this as a first spell in, on their turn mm-hmm. and just kind of be like indicating like i'm going to do something here that i want my things to have shroud for yeah so trying to like bait out counter spells or something um or i can see someone just flashing it in because they want to make something unblockable <laughs> And with the amount of artifact, as you were saying before we were discuss- we started the episode, artifact reduction 
making the three mana being a little bit expensive for this kind of an effect, I would say, that's only one turn cycle or not even a full turn cycle, mm -hmm. um, making it much more reasonable at two or one mana or even less sometimes. Yeah. Um, we're getting some good reprints. We're getting a reprint of Propaganda, which I think is pretty cool. Uh, Xiao Jun seems interesting. Uh, one blue red for a three, three human assassin. As long as it's your turn, uh, she has first strike and flying, and then you can tap two untapped artifacts and it deals one damage to each opponent. Seems in uh, kind of interesting as like a, an, is it commander of sorts where you just kind of want a ton of, uh, like get a bunch of treasures, get a bunch of incidental artifacts mm -hmm. that don't really need to be tapped to do their various effects. I feel I feel like a weird like is it stacks thing going on with all of like the random artifacts sure. and then just pinging effects and just locking down what everyone can do. Uh and then also having just a 3/3 flyer that's going to be able to kill chump blockers or bigger blockers before yeah. it gets taken out that sort of that sort of leap strike which is what the, her ability is called that as long as your turn it has flying and first strike we've been seeing a lot more of that recently where it's as long as it's your turn it has evasion yeah um which obviously is kind of you know wizards is maybe signaling to us that we're trying to push it into a more aggressive sort of uh uh, we want you to attack with this. Yeah, we're pushing pushing that the the game into a little more of aggressive environment because it's a it's a great attacker. It's not such a great blocker. Yeah, I'm totally okay with that. It's an interesting little playstyle, but you know, um, we got the viewpoint synchronization, which is a good example of free running. Uh, for four to green, you can search your library for up to three basic land cards and reveal them. Put two of them onto the battlefield tapped and the other into your hand, then shuffle. Five mana to ramp you two and then guarantee your next land drop is a very fair rate. But if you've dealt damage with your commander or an assassin, that's three mana, which then suddenly becomes an, a spectacular rate. Yeah, better cultivate. It is a... It is a decidedly it's a power crept this is power crept cultivate this is better than cultivate <laughs> but the, this is just one of the one of the better examples in my opinion of free running being a major cost reducer the other one ooh, i'm gonna scroll down and find it the other one is the blue draw three card where is it where is it Oh my gosh! Did it disappear off of this list? No, it was just further, just further down. down. I didn't hide. I didn't hide the reprints. I'm such a fool. We're, we use we use MTG Goldfish to look at uh, spoiled cards, and I like to hide the reprints generally, uh, just so that we can get past it quickly. Where is it? Here we go. No, that's become anonymous. Here we go. Eagle Vision, which is four and a blue, draw three cards as a sorcery. A five mana draw three is basically exactly the rate for every card that had, most every card that just simply lets you draw three. I mean, mm -hmm. I think of Lorien Revealed, where it was three blue, blue, five total mana, draw three cards, and then it had the upside of island cycling. Yeah. Um, Eagle Vision also has free running one and a blue. Draw three cards for uh, for one in a blue after you've punched somebody in the face. Sounds good to me. Two mana draw three is probably one of the best rates you can get on that kind of an effect, which is obscene and wonderful in every way. What do uh, I call redonkulous? Rather redonkulous. What do you? What else you want to talk about? What do? You, what other cards speak to you? Uh, actually, if you scroll back down, there was uh, oh, keep going uh, right next to uh, 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 free running. Oh my goodness. Next to the one we were looking at? Yes. Oh, yeah. Become Anonymous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Two blue blue for an instant. Exile target non-token non creature you control and the top two cards of your library in a face down pile. Shuffle that pile, then cloak those cards. They enter the battlefield tapped. So this, I think is very fun. Uh, obviously, this is going to be protection, since if they target your creature with something, you get to uh, save it by exiling it. It reminds me very much of the Yu-Gi-Oh card from the, I don't know I don't know about the real card, how it works, but from the anime, Magic Hat. A yeah. uh, very classic card from the anime where I target your Dark Magician. Well, I'm going to use Magic Hat and yada, yada, yada. Great card. That's a fun, that's a fun one. I think four mana is a little bit too much to hold up but you're also basically getting the top two cards off of your deck 
into play for yeah. free as so well. So you're getting protection. You're getting six uh, six power toughness onto the field, and those two top two cards of your deck, you can then ca- turn them face up for their casting cost later. If they are a creature. If they are a creature, yes. If they're not a creature, then you just kind of whatever else isn't able to be cast unless you kill it and then have a way to recur it or something. Um, we we need to have a we need to have a conversation with the game designers for a moment. <laughs> okay. The the Capitoline Triad is a colorless 10 mana 7/7 seven, seven legendary god artificer. It is two very important abilities. The first one, it's never actually going to cost 10 because the spell costs one less to cast for each historic card in your graveyard. Enchantment or er, sagas, artifacts, legendaries. Yes. The other more important one, this is an activated ability. Exile any number of historic cards from your graveyard with total mana value 30 or greater. You get an emblem with creatures you control have base power and toughness 9-9. Nine, nine. Yeah. For one, it's very, very easy to get a less than 7 mana 7-7 seven, seven onto the battlefield. Yes. That's a very good rate. Very, very good rate. This is not a... I would argue this is not a commander. You would... It, colorless is a little hard. Yeah. Though, at the same time, in colorless commander decks, you have a lot of overcosted things. Because they are colorless, you can pitch things to the graveyard somewhat easily. So it might be easier to get that exile clause out there, and then everything's a 9-9. Including things that are very common in colorless deck, which is the 0-1 Eldrazi spawn. Yes creature token which can now just be a 9-9 9-9 because of some fucking artificer gods yeah or some some constructs some thopters some serva you your, or- some- your ornithopter your yeah. ornithopter your 9-9 yeah. or- flying ornithopter yeah um is it busted beyond all imagining obviously not uh <laughs> it this it's a scary thing to have in the command zone because it's one of those like you build a deck to kind of operate and run by itself and then whenever the player decides to cast their commander Mm -hmm. you've got to be on alert because it's not going to cost 10 mana it's going to cost like two or three it's going to cost very little and then by the point that it enters the battlefield they're activating that ability immediately and suddenly everything on their board is a threat yeah so, I, w- I would include this as a win con in uh it's a, in, it's a command zone win con for sure yeah which is always very scary to me i don't like them i don't <laughs> like them um do you have anything else you want to talk about there's not really much that stood out to me beyond that there are, i will say this is going to be full of a lot of interesting cards um one-offs one-offs yeah oh here is actually one that i do want to talk about the knight the templar knight uh, it's a one and one and a white for a human knight three one with vigilance. You can pay a white, tap five untapped attacking creatures you control named Templar Knight, and search your library for a legendary artifact card and put it on the battlefield and shuffle. But this is the most uh, the the part that's interesting is a deck can have any number of cards named Templar Knight. That will be that will be fun because it's basically a one mana tutor for an artifact. Put it onto the battlefield for free mm-hmm. uh, if you can get what is it five. five untapped attacking creatures so you need to swing them in um they're probably going to die because they're three ones but they have vigilance so you're able to tap them at to activate this ability also, um they're three ones so they're going to take out a lot of uh, chump blockers absolutely but this uh this now every color has a card that says you can have any number of these in your deck mm-hmm. what deck wants this effect uh, this would probably... I don't know off the top of my head what deck wants to think. White, white artifact decks. You would probably want to be mono-white, because if you're going to include any number, you're going to want a critical mass of Templar Knights. I mean, a critical mass of 2-mana, 3-1 Vigilant Creatures is a fine rate as is. Yeah. But I'm curious what kind of deck would want this ability as like a core feature of their deck to just cheat in to how because you gotta you gotta think how many of these things are going to die on whatever they're attacking into and how many times are you going to be able to repeat this ability and is that worth it 
I mean, at the same time, uh, you know, you can look at any of the other, however many there are of the, the if you look at the red one dragon's approach, uh, you got. That's one. That's a narrow win con. It's a narrow win con. It's a very narrow win con. And I, the and persistent most- petitioners is the same kind of thing, but at least that one, you're not having to swing in with them. And it's really only good in Bruvac. True. You know, um, the most interesting one to me is the more recent Slime Against Humanity. Yeah, oh, I really like Slime Against Humanity. Because that one, that one, it's not a win. It's not some weird edge case win con. It's just kind of a subtle, continuous accruing of creature-based value. Yeah. Which is, prob- I think, the best of the effects. Because then you also have Shadow... Well, Shadowborn Apostle is also pretty good for cheating in big demons yeah so it's dragons demons artifacts yeah then the rats of course just are annoying and and i like the rats uh, i like the rats so i think the rats and the slimes are the most powerful but i like that this rounds out the the cycle the cycle if you will yeah actually socrates is also very interesting uh socrates is a uh, one in azorius so one white blue for a zero four defender he has hexproof as long as he's untapped and you can tap him. Until end of turn, target creature gains. If this creature would deal combat damage to a player, prevent that damage. That This creature's controller, meaning so- uh, Socrates, and the player and that player each draw half that many cards rounded down. So. It's an interesting wording. Right? If this creature would deal combat. Oh, sorry. It, it, yeah, so the creature. Interesting. Oh, sorry. No, that's on. That's the ability. So the creature that's attacking, uh, that's creature's controller, and so, and the player that just got pre- damage prevented. So, you can the way. Obviously, the immediate thing is you're you swing in with something, you prevent the damage, and then you and another player draw a card. Mm-hmm. You can also do. I think this is more interesting as a defensive ability when someone swings into you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And you prevent damage, and then instead you and the other player draw cards. And if you have a way, there's I'm, there's a fair number of ways in Azorius Colors to get more value off of you and your opponent drawing a card mm-hmm. than just uh, than your opponents would naturally have from drawing cards themselves, unless you're playing against children. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I will say the the ability is named Socratic Dialogue. Which is kind of like, yeah, this is going to be your deal-making commander. Yeah, this is... Yeah, well, yeah you can attack me with that 9-9, nine, nine, and then we'll both draw cards. Yeah, it's totally fine. Am I going to get more value out of drawing those cards? Almost assuredly. Do I... Am I running effects that you that limit the number of cards you're allowed to draw in a turn? Yes, of course I have Narset Parter Avails. <laughs> or maybe I have Teferi's Ageless Insight. Exactly. Exactly. There's, there's, it seems like it could be a big downside to let your opponent draw a lot of cards, but there's a lot of ways that you get way more value out of that yeah. than they would. That is it. That's one of the more interesting ones to me. Um, Sigurd has boast. Yeah. So Naya, which is just red, bl- green, white for a three, three human warrior, legendary creature, vigilance, trample, life flink, three mana, three, three with three keywords that are very useful. Also has Boast, where you pay one mana, and you put a lore counter on a target saga you control, or remove one from it. And then whenever you put a lore counter on a saga you control, you put a plus one, plus one counter on up to one other target creature. For those of you that don't know, Boast, you can activate only if this creature attacked this turn, and only once each turn. So basically, a little bit of control for sagas and lore counters and... We know that that's what Naya is trying to do with this little yeah, weird. It works mini set. really well with Ivor, the Naya Ivor, where she can recur uh, sagas and lands from the graveyard. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Also, I I just like a three mana, three mana, three three with three good keywords you know, on being it. Being on nice. rate, that's pretty great. There's being on rate is pretty great, <laughs> as they say. Uh, there's some interesting lands in the set that I honestly am not too thrilled by i think brotherhood headquarters is going to be one of the better ones it comes in untapped it can tap for colorless it can tap for a mana of any color but you can only use it for an assassin spell a spell that has free running or activating an ability of assassin uh if you have an if you have a commander that happens to be an assassin i feel like this is an auto include yeah um 
and then there's a lot of good free running uh, any any of the any of the if you're running any of the commanders in this set obviously you're going to have that card uh there's a lot of decks that also just incidentally have a lot of assassins that this could go well in as well um of, of all the special lands like nothing of none of them seem particularly crazy to me um I'm I'm not really the target audience for this set in general. I would say, um, I think I think that this set, yeah, I I obviously am enjoying some of this just because it's a very it's something that's uh, that I enjoy. I'm a big fan of the series. Um, I think what this set suffers from is this whole. Well, obviously, being a very limited set, there are going to be 100 cards uh, in this set. There are some very good reprints. They're reprinting a couple of the sword cycle. But it's not... It's modern legal, but it's not directed at any one format. Right? Not at all. Like, when you build, com- when they build a commander deck, uh, those cards are meant for commander and are very useful in a lot of commander scenarios. When they put out this modern, this modern Horizons 3 set, they made a lot of callbacks and a lot of things that would be useful to buff up the modern uh the modern meta currently you know when they make a standard set that's good for drafting and and uh and and limited they're going to be putting in cards that are draftable that are draftable playable are are you know very you know uh on rate commons and uncommons that have good abilities here it's kind of just a a fun smattering of whatever of whatever they can uh, uh kind of tie in from the video games into the cards which is cool but it's it, it, it's niche it's very niche there's going to be a lot of there's going to be a lot of very interesting singles in this set uh i'm interested to see what the deck lists will be for um for the the starter Starters. decks and because you there's no commons in this set correct so I've, I'm interested to see what the face cards are going to be. I'm interested to see what they include in those decks. Um, but yeah, until we know the deck lists of that, I don't know if I would re- necessarily recommend any of these. I would say buy the singles and wait until the booster boxes crash in price. I'm I'm interested to see which cards will find homes in which formats. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, each format has... always. I always find it fun when uh, you, you're like, this card sucks and then like three months later it's like this card that sucked is 17 dollars because actually really good in this specific in thing this specific thing or it just so happens and because now it's good in a specific thing and it just so happened to be a mythic rare in this very niche set that no one bought it's now expensive yeah just by the nature of its limited availability so do you have anything else you want to say about the assassin's creed universes beyond i'm still gonna buy some packs for two reasons well we got the chaos draft that's one the other is nostalgia yeah so we do we do our monday night magic live streams every monday we play magic the gathering on youtube and tiktok and as sets have been coming out this year we've been getting two packs from the sets and throwing them in a box and then at the end of the year we're gonna take all the packs one each and eat them we're going to create a sealed deck to play them against each other Moving away from Magic the Gathering, we're going to talk about Dungeons and Dragons, the revised 5th edition. They did an hour-long little debut video, and every single day during the during the week, they're going to be releasing new videos where they talk about basically everything mm-hmm. in the player's handbook going through in very gross detail. So by the time you are listening to this podcast, uh, we're probably missing a fair bit of information because new videos have come out and we haven't watched them yet because we're recording in the past you and it's that? not the present. No. And we're not your eventual future. Possibly. Maybe. Do you want us to? Be? Ooh. Let us know. Ooh. Try the Patreon and just uh, put that in the feed. Episode 69. I'm really into these guys. I would like to marry them. 69. Episode 69. Episode 69. Nice. Nice. All right. Subclasses. Subclasses. Um, Is that where we're starting? No. We're going to start with the price. (laughs) Price, price, and price. So all of the print versions of the book are going to be $50 for the Player's Handbook, the Dungeon Master's Guide, and the Monster Manual, and it's going to be a little bit more for the alternative covers for them. As always. As always. As always. Uh, $30 for the digital versions on D&D Beyond. Uh, you can bundle the three physical and the three digital for the same rate, 150 for print and uh, 
90, 90 for the digital versions. You can get a bundle on D&D Beyond of the digital and the physical together, and that's where you're going to get a $60 saving. So it'll be 180 for all three of them physically and all three of them digitally on D&D Beyond. Probably the best deal if you know you're going to get the digital and the physical versions of them. Yeah. I'm going to say... These prices are actually surprising based on what they announced after Big B's or yes. upcoming to Big B's, uh, which was we're raising our prices. Yeah. Uh, and we know these books are going to be thick. They're going to be much larger than the original core three books from 2014. Uh, there are some people that are complaining about the prices, as people I, always do. I think I paid $50 for each of my yeah. 2014 edition. I think I got, I think my player's handbook was on sale. I got it for like 45 Nice. I think $50 is very fair for the physical prints of the books. $30 for the digital versions of these books. You are dying today, sir. I am. Cough, so cough. I just it's, all the, it's all the 69ing. Yes. Yeah. I swallowed wrong. <laughs> <laughs> that you did that you did I'm gonna try drinking water again can confirm thirty dollars for the digital versions of the core three D books i think is a very very good deal uh, a lot of people are complaining that it's way too expensive i think a lot of people are starting to get too used to random indie rpg pricing yeah um kids on bikes is much more inexpensive the so they actually they are coming out or they just came out with their second edition and that one is more on rate with this but that is still hardcover yeah if you want to get the the old version it's 25 bucks you can get it for a free pdf online yeah uh pathfinder is a little bit cheaper um but i think these are very very fair prices for the core books will the supplement books later be an increased price who knows probably but I think this is a very fair rate. So what we have learned so far as of the recording of this video on June 19th, we have all of the subclasses listed out, some of them new, some of them renamed, pretty much all of them touched in some way. Oh, touched in some way. 69. Oh, touched in some way <laughs> by this revising process. And we got some information on character building and some other stuff we'll get into. But first, we're just going to go through all of the subclasses. Uh, there are 48 total subclasses. Each class has exactly four subclasses, so it is even across the board. Uh, some of them, that means you have an additional subclass option. For some of them, that means you have a reduced number of subclass options. Looking at you, cleric. And wizard. And wizard. God, they were so hard for the cleric and wizard back in 2014. They really were. And they hated... Monks. Monks. <laughs> they really hated the monks. They really hated them. All right, so the Barbarian, you have the Path of the Berserker. You have the Path of the Wild Heart, which is just the renamed Path of Totem Warrior. Uh, we have the Path of the World Tree, which is new to Dungeons & Dragons entirely, and then Path of the Zealot, which was imported from Xanathar's Guide to Everything. The Bard, you have the College of Dance, which is a new entirely. You have the College of Glamour, College of Lore, and College of Valor. College of Glamour is imported, I believe, from Tasha's. I believe you're correct. Uh, the Life Domain Cleric, the Light Domain Cleric, the Trickery Domain Cleric, and the War Domain Cleric, all from the original Player's Handbook. Uh, the Druid, you have the Circle of the Land, Circle of the Moon, Circle of the Stars, which is from Tasha's, and then the Circle of the Sea, which is brand new. Uh, the Fighter, you get the Battlemaster, the Champion, the Eldritch Knight, and then the Psy Warrior from Tasha's. The, let's see, monk. the Monk, you get the Warrior of Mercy, which is from Tasha's. You get the Warrior of Shadow. You get the Warrior of Elements, which is the revamped Wave of the Four Elements, and it's going to be way better, I think. And then the Warrior of the Open Hand, originally from the PHP. Paladin, you got the Oath of Devotion, Oath of Glory, Oath of the Ancients, Oath of Vengeance, all from the original. Revenge. Ranger, you got a massively revised Beastmaster, which is going to play basically completely differently. Uh, the Fey Wanderer from Xanathar's, the Gloomstalker from Xanathar's, and the Hunter are now all in the PHB. The Rogue, you get the Arcane Trickster, the Assassin, the Thief, all from the original, and then the Soul Knife imported from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. The Sorcerer, you have the Aberrant Sorcerer, the Clockwork Sorcerer, the Draconic Sorcerer, and the Wild Magic Sorcerer. Uh, the Clockwork is from Tasha's. I believe the Aberrant is from Tasha's as well. Yes, because that's where they brought in a lot of those psi mm -hmm. the psionics exactly and the warlock you have the archfey the celestial the fiend and the great old one the celestials from xanathar's guide to everything the wizard you can only be an abjurer a diviner an evoker or an illusionist in as the of right handbook. now is as of right now. we can expect to see others in the future absolutely 
Absolutely. So those are all the subclasses. A couple of new ones. They made an emphasis to bring in a lot more psionic subclasses so that specifically the great old one warlock isn't just looking for its buddies. Yeah, they were saying back in 2014 that was something they originally wanted to do, but they just didn't have the capacity. Yeah, they they ran out of time. <laughs> that, that's what uh, that capacity, means. Capacity, yes, in the in the in the. Uh, the business sense. Business. Having business. the hours. Legitimate business. As a legitimate businessman. Legitimate business. So that's very fun. I like psionics. I've Seeing how the Psy Warrior and the Soul Knife specifically played out in Tasha's, mm-hmm. I think those are very interesting subclass options. Uh, obviously, I will probably, if I were to play a, a, a fighter, I would still probably choose Battlemaster. Yeah. <laughs> Particularly with all the weapon masteries, which have been refined. There are new options that were not present in any of the Unearthed Arcana. And every class is going to have the option through either native features of the class or through grabbing feats to have access to weapon mastery. Yes. And then obviously the fighter is going to be the king of weapon masteries in general. That's their new focus, which I think is very exciting. Weapon mastery, we it's probably one of my most exciting for me, I'm most excited for mm. yeah, in they, the set. Uh, Jeremy Crawford and, and uh, Chris Perkins were saying that they, after having worked and designed all of these and been playtesting them, they said they were recently in a game where they were playing 2014 without Webmasters, and they're like, it's 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 empty. There's something missing. I'm I'm, I'm needing. Yeah. Got to have that hit of gotta, the weapon masters. You gotta, it's just that little bit of tactical nuance yeah. in the gameplay that makes it more interesting as a martial player. Which has often been missing in the past. Absolutely. Um, we now know what heroic, what the inspiration is going to be in general. Yeah. So inspiration for a very long time uh, has been just an advantage on a D20 roll. And they were playing around with what they're now calling heroic inspiration in a lot of different ways of doing it. Some more complex that we didn't like, some just bringing it back to advantage, being really easy to access. This is probably the best version of it mm-hmm. in my mind. It will now be a re-roll as opposed to advantage. So you get your result, because there's a million ways to generate an advantage. They didn't want it to just be another way to get yeah. an advantage. It was too boring. It wasn't used enough. But as a re-roll, you get to roll the dice, you get to see the result, and then before the result is adjudicated, you can choose to use your um, your heroic inspiration to re-roll that dice. And it does not apply only to d20 rolls. Yeah. It can apply to damage rolls. It can pre- uh, apply to percentile. It can apply to when the DM says, hey, roll 3d4 for me. No reason. <laughs> There's I would, always a reason. I wouldn't I wouldn't do it in that instance because sometimes those sometimes those DM rolls it's like I want you to roll really low on this. You would want to re- roll really low on this. It's like it's you get it, it gives you more again, more usage and more tactical advantage and makes it something that you're going to remember to use because mm-hmm. it's like, oh, I can get advantage by flanking, I can get advantage with this class feature, I can get advantage it's, that way. The advantage is a very strong mechanical feature. It's also a very well used mechanical feature in the game itself uh and and i as uh, personally i know when dming 2014 edition rarely gave out inspiration just because like i mean i can give you it but you've already built your character to have advantage in every possible way so yeah eh, whatever so it's now a feature that's going to be able to be used yes which is very nice that's um, something we're about here is making sure all the features are used. Yeah, like that's why our our own ho- our own homebrew supplement, the Blood Magic and Hemocraft supplement, you can get it on Drive Through RPG. You can also get it on Patreon for five dollars. Uh, where one of the core things we wanted to do was give you a, a way to use hit dice because mm-hmm. hit dice just aren't really used at most tables, and so you can now use it as a resource to fuel your various features and abilities through Blood Magic and Hemocraft. You should check that out. Do you like that underhanded toss there for you to talk about that? Oh, I like. Ooh, I like when you underhandedly toss me. Move on. Episode sixty nine. Uh, <laughs> that's all this episode is. It's just like, yeah. more, or, uh, slightly more innuendos than normal. In your endo. <laughs> hey. hey. Okay. Pride month. Episode sixty nine. Brandon stops subscribing after this. <laughs> and Brandon's like, I'm canceling my subscription. Now. <laughs> Brandon's our fifteen dollar a month patron. He's the goat. We'll shout him out at the end. Of course, as as you can do if you support us at the fifteen dollar tier. Uh, we're probably we're probably going to add more tiers for like spell table based things for Magic the Gathering and the whole. We'll, we'll get into that. Typical Gemini was giving us a lot of shit about that on the bonus episode that you'll get next week. Yes, next week. Yes. Let's do it into character building now through the player's handbook. They gave more specifics on the character building process, and they want. They want it to start by selecting your class before mm-hmm. anything else, because uh, that's going to determine the majority of how your your character will play yeah. at the table. 
after that, they they liked they they are now looking at backgrounds and species as the two core pillars of your backstory. Yes, effectively. Uh, so the background is now where you're going to be getting your ability score improvements as opposed to from your species. Mm-hmm. Um, they wanted they were doing that partially as like well. Humans are varied in their in their strength and size and stature, and they originally did that uh, in 2014. And you could get plus one to basically anything in terms of your stats. Uh, but they didn't. They wanted to give you that kind of flexibility with all of the with all of the race options or species options, as they're calling them now. I still think they should call it ancestry. It's a better species. Yeah, I agree. Is just, I agree. It's too scientific. It's weird. But they don't want you to be like, oh, all elves are very dexterous. Yeah. Or all orcs are strong. You know, they want to give you flexibility with your storytelling. There. They were getting away from that with the way they started doing it in Tasha's, uh, making it this kind of you get two plus, uh, plus two and a plus one to something or three plus ones. Mm-hmm. And now, as you're saying, they're tying that into the background. Yes, so uh, you now get a plus two and a plus one or three plus ones to up to three ability scores based on which background you choose. So if you are choosing the background of an acolyte, that means you've devoted your time to a temple or a monastery or a church or some kind of mm-hmm. structure and, and, and organization. And as such, if you do that and you give devotion to something, you're much more likely to have a benefit to your intelligence, your wisdom, or your charisma based on your character's decisions. So the benefits you are getting to your attributes, your statistics are based more on the actions of your character more than a predetermined species that you Mm -hmm. were born into. Um, I think partially that is just more modern sensibilities about things. Uh, but I think it also just makes logical sense I, in I, a lot of ways. I would agree that it makes that, that makes logical sense. Per, um, yeah, uh, I had a thought and I lost it. Go on. <laughs> the backgrounds are also providing you with level one feats now as well. They offer a small, each background offers a small selection. Uh, some of the feats are going to be much more common across all of the backgrounds, something like skilled, which mm-hmm. is much more generic. Uh, or like alert is offered by several ones uh, that the the feats specifically are going to tie in more with what the background is trying to indicate. Yes, uh, and remember what I was going to say, which is obviously there are still going to be some backgrounds that are going to work better for classes mm-hmm. because they only offer you they offer you half of the half of the ability scores in each background uh to give your bus your bonuses to Mm -hmm. however that being said that it's far less far more open as they were intending especially now uh, a lot of these a lot of classes you're not just dependent on one statistic or two statistics like there's usually a third statistic that's being splashed in there and it's across what i what i deem are the two types of ability scores which are your physical ability scores and your mental ability scores Mm -hmm. Dexterity, strength, and constitution, and then intelligence, wisdom, charisma are two different groupings. And there are some backgrounds that are going to lean entirely into one and entirely into the other. And those are going to lean more towards the classes that rely on those things. And that's that's just kind of how things work out in the real world, you know? Mm-hmm. If you're an acolyte and you're spending a lot of time in prayer and devotion to a monastery or a church of some kind, uh, that kind of background and that kind of work isn't going to help you be buff. <laughs> you know, like that, that's, there is limiting factors and that's, you kind of have to have limiting factors. You can't just have everything open or it's just a free for all. Mm-hmm. So I'm totally cool with that. Um, so yeah, there, all of the back, all of the character building, like backstory is the combination of your background and your species in terms of species. Uh, they have a wide variety in terms of complexity. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they want some that are more easily accessible. So like an orc, you get the you get the benefits of the orc yeah and that's just how it is if you play the asmr uh you're going to have a co- or no the goliath goliath where you're going to get a couple of giant options so you can make there's a there's a choice point mm-hmm. with the species itself so there's some species that are going to lean more into customizability and some that are more uniform in their abilities 
which is just a nice benefit for various levels of play and what you're trying to get out of your experience. Lastly, in terms of character building, they are offering a lot more detailed quick start guidance in terms of giving example ability score arrays based on the standard array yep. for each of the classes. And then also offering a lot more examples for starting play and rules for starting play at all levels, not just level one. Yeah, they wanted to make sure that obviously there's different there's the different there's a whole spectrum of players and how they like to build their characters. Some people love to build a very efficient and a very min-max character. And they're saying, hey, you don't have to, you know, this is what we've seen as being some of the more, the better ones to start with for that. Or if you're just your first time playing, making sure that people understand what they're choosing, uh, especially, got first time player. Oh, man. So many options. It, and that quick start, that quick build guide in 2014 is okay. And that's where it is. It's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you're also able to pre order a lot of character sheets and stuff right now, and a lot of quick start aids. Uh, you can also pre order the DM screen yep. as well right now. Everything's up for pre order. Oh, I didn't mention that. All of the books are up for pre order right now. Yep. So you can go to wherever you want to get your books and you can pre order them right now, which is pretty cool. Um, that is the main bits that we have from the player's handbook. Uh, the rules glossary is going to be exceptionally more useful. Uh, it's just kind of an all in one place for all of the major important rules for the game system. Um, they, they were working hard to, with various parts of the book, be they spells, classes, feats, that kind of stuff to offer the amount of explanation for a rule where it is pertinent, mm -hmm. but then sometimes being like, just go to this page and read the whole fucking thing. Because yeah. you're going to need to know the whole fucking thing for this. Um, I hope they use that specifically. I, I want I want to see fuck in the book. <laughs> uh, they spend a lot of time talking about the art as well. Oh, about, yeah. Uh, the combination of art with the design process happening at the same time, so they mesh well together. Mm -hmm. uh, interesting, like, artistic design uh, decisions of, like, all, all of the like character building stuff when you're looking at the classes all the classes are shown in line art yeah you're like filling in the details of your character and yeah in 2014 they really went with this kind of well one it was just kind of hey we have this thing can you create some art for it but it ended up being like the pinnacle of of the mm -hmm. classes like that rogue that rogue that's in the 2014 book is the rogue looks sick as hell yeah probably not the rogue you're gonna be playing until 20 level okay. but yeah so now they're they're put and they also including like you know, uh, uh, how these characters and their backgrounds, mm -hmm. you know, fit into their societies and things like that. It's very cool. Yeah. So let's move on to the Dungeon Master's Guide. Not a ton they talked about with the Dungeon Master's Guide. Uh, we already know that they announced it's going to be set in Greyhawk specifically. So the official campaign setting for base revised 5th edition is Greyhawk, which is our first return to Greyhawk in a very long time. So that's very exciting. Uh, you're going to get the Pantheon as shown in Greyhawk, a lot of a lot of the example uh, adventures now. We have five pre-written adventures, just short individual adventures that are included in the Dungeon Master's Guide now. Uh, they, af they offer a very large section of guidance for designing your own adventures and then use that advice to... Uh, and apply it to those five pre-written adventures so you can see what they're telling you to do and then see how they implement it themselves into the adventure. And all of that will be applicable to Greyhawk, and I imagine you can graft it onto any other setting oh, as likely, well. Oh, likely, yeah. The thing that excites me the most is the Bastion system. Yes. When uh, we saw this in the Unearthed Arcana, we were very interested. Very interested. Specifically, how it is going to play at the table. Because they wanted it to be, you're an adventurer, you're going on your adventures, and then here's a little mini game for stronghold buildings. Because strongholds have been in D&D forever, and there's a million different stronghold uh, systems that you can graft onto D&D, and mm -hmm. some designed specifically for D&D. Uh, like the, what is it, the strongholds and fortresses that you got? Strongholds and followers from Matt Colville, MCDM. Mm -hmm. Yes. So with bastions, you, you have your bastion, and the players are effectively the DMs for their Bastion. And they have their NPCs. They have their own characters that are there for their Bastion. And the DM can simply say, it's like, okay, you, like you finished a dungeon. And now you're having your long rest outside the dungeon in the forest. And you can be like, okay, you get a Bastion turn. Mm -hmm. And then there's the list of things you can do. It's all, they also mentioned in the video, some, it could be as simple as, 
oh, we had we had a session scheduled. Someone had to cancel. The DM can't make it. The DM can be like, all right, instead, everybody takes a bastion turn and you tell me what your what happens at your bastion. And that's how your your stronghold effectively can grow. And it gives you something fun to do outside of session. It's like a little glimpse at DMing in a mm-hmm. sense, too. I think that's very interesting. And I like that it's divorcing itself from the adventuring yeah. aspect of D&D as well. Yeah, I get that. Yeah. Pretty cool. The Monster Manual. The Monster Manual now. They they made a point to include more stat blocks in the player's handbook. Mm-hmm. So all of the summoning spells are going to have all of basically all of the options. You're going to have most of the options for Wild Shape, uh, the familiars, all that kind of stuff. Something that wasn't present in the 2014 player's <laughs> handbook, which I find hilarious, the mounts. Yeah. The mounts section. You could buy the mounts, any of them, in 2014. They didn't all have stat blocks. <laughs> now they all have stat blocks in the player's handbook, which is very convenient. Um, but for the monster manual specifically, they have over 75 new monsters specifically. Uh, many options for creatures uh, are in the player's handbook now as well, but they're also shown in the monster manual. Uh, they are expanding the the challenge rating range for a lot of the creature families. They pointed out specifically the vampires uh, having a somewhat narrow range. Mm-hmm. So at lower levels, you couldn't really encounter them because they'd be too strong. And then at higher levels, you wouldn't really want to encounter them because the, the top vampire was not very strong. Yeah. That's not named uh, Strahd. Yes, right. <laughs> Just the vampire lord. Or yeah. Just the daddy. vampire. Daddy. 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 Episode 69. Daddy. It was Father's Day recently, too. Daddy. Daddy. Ooh. Ooh. So, with the vampires, they talk about a lower CR1 that's like a vampire that's going through the process of becoming a vampire. So, they're still a little bit weaker. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then a higher level vampire lord that's even more powerful than the original vampire stat block. That's something that is a challenge for higher level parties. And they've been doing that across all of the, a lot of the, uh, the main creature families. Because you would have your ancient dragons. You would have your Tarrasque. You would have the Lich. Though, I think they should probably revise the Lich a little bit. Um, as like the pinnacle of undead for the lich or monstrosity for the Tarrasque or dragons for the ancient dragons. Yeah. Uh, but a lot of these creature families didn't really have uh, an apex version of themselves. Yeah, it really made it tough to, especially if you're in a campaign setting, for example, or just trying to run an entire campaign or adventure that spans multiple levels. But you have to, you have like, ah, oh, well, I have to start with just people and then eventually they will work their way up to killing a mummy a god and then the <laughs> dragon and then a god but now it's like, oh yeah okay now you can go all the way through uh the, the constructs or mm-hmm. the or the fair they did they did call out the specifics one they have like a colossus construct uh they have an arch hag for the fey uh the elemental juggernaut for elementals and then samuel the blob of annihilation for your the- your your apex ooze. Yes, I'm a big ooze person. Very very ooh, very oozy. Ooze. Ooh. I actually don't have bones. Man, that makes it really hard to sixty nine. Nice. One of nice. Uh, they they also made a point to call out returning monsters. Mm-hmm. Uh, if a monster stat block existed in the monster manual. Or in, I assume they're going to be bringing, probably bringing things from like Volo's Guide to Monsters and that One kind of hope. stuff. One would hope. Um, if those are in the monster manual for the revised fifth edition, they are going to have the same challenge rating as their counterparts in 2014, specifically so that those new stat blocks are compatible with pre-written adventures and campaign modules and all of that stuff. So things are still cross compatible. But they have, they did take the opportunity to still uh, revise a lot of these stat blocks and make them, they weren't changing the challenge rating, but they were giving them more appropriate abilities and mm-hmm. things like that for the challenge rating. And organizing the stat blocks in the new way of, I, I like I like how they've been revising yes. the organization of having actions, bonus actions, reactions grouped together. So much easier to run. Oh, it's, it's a godsend. That was one of my favorite changes that they made toward the end of uh, Old Fifth. Yes. Prior revi- unre- Ooh, what's the what are we going to call old 5th edition now? The Elder Ooh. Millennial version? The eld the Elder Millennial 5th edition. That the, ooh, oh. 
Yeah. My my now favorite part of the monster manual, the wide array of expansion they've made to NPC stat blocks. Yes, yes. They wanted early on. You'll always encounter your NPCs, and uh, those stat blocks go by the wayside once your characters start to level. You can only run so many bandits. Yeah. Now you're going to have them expanded across the range of CRs. You're also going to have them expanded across uh, niches and ability sets. So you're not going to just have one longbow guy. You're going to have like a couple of different ranged options and you're going to have new families of NPC options in like a family of bard stat blocks mm-hmm. and expanded spellcaster stat blocks and everything just more NPCs to use because they realized in their play and then community play NPC stat blocks were getting used way more than pretty much any other of the monster stat blocks. Mhm. So that'll be exciting. Very great for DMs. Again, uh, they're going to be doing daily videos that go into gross detail for all of the subclasses, classes, player's handbook feature, rules, glossary, spells every weekday for... They just said every weekday, so I guess forever until the end of time. Good for them. Good for them. They have so much time to make content, apparently. That's a a lot of content. That's a lot of content. Do you have anything you would like to say about the revised 5th edition as we know it? You know, there was a time as they're doing, as we've been, we've been looking at every Unearthed Arcana over the past two years, and there were definitely times where our, we were concerned about what they were what they were doing with the game and what changes they were actually going to make. As we're starting to see this kind of you know mature into its final evolution before printing, or or what they're telling us before before we can buy the books. Um, you can see where they've listened to the community, where they've looked at other systems and other add-ons and other things that people have been using in D&D for a long time. My God, one one thing they said right at the beginning of the video uh, that we haven't mentioned is, they're oh, like, yeah. yeah, now in the rules, rules is written, it is now a bonus action to drink a potion. Yep. We've been doing that forever. They've been doing it forever. Everyone's been doing it forever. So that's just the rule now. <laughs> you drink you drink a potion as a bonus action. Yeah. Yeah, with with what they've what they've shown so far, what they've told us so far, it sounds like they, you know, maybe maybe it's just uh, good old Jeremy and and Chris that they're they they're hyped, they've revitalized everybody, and uh, we're actually hopefully getting a good, well priced, well thought out, and hopefully non controversial product finally. Uh, that would be that would be wonderful. I I th- I'm very I'm very optimistic for the revised fifth edition whether or not it is adopted by people after all the controversies and stuff will be to be determined but i also it it's dungeons and dragons Mm -hmm. it's the name in tabletop rpgs and i imagine if the system works well which i don't see why it wouldn't right at this point they've they've been building on this on the core system that they built since before 2014, since before 5th edition was released, I imagine this is going to be massaged and polished to a shine. Um, They licked it, probably. Ooh. Ooh, 69. 69. (laughs) That's so fucking stupid. I I am more excited for revised 5th edition than I think I've been. Yes. Um, yes. It's clear that it, it they've said it, but it's also now clear in what they've been showing and describing and telling us about the books that, yeah, they were throwing stuff at the wall and seeing what stuck, seeing how far they could push things, seeing what the community thought, and we're just getting as much feedback as possible. Mm-hmm. And I think we're we're in for we're in for a treat with the as revised fifth edition. A tweet as a treat, little treat for uh, me. A tw- uh, a D and D fifth edition revision revised edition. As a treat. Mm-hmm. So, let's move on to the wrap-up. We've got three little wrap-up items that don't really warrant a whole discussion in and of themselves, but are worth mentioning none the less. First of all, the most popular, now over a million subscriber YouTube channel. The first to hit a million in the Magic the Gathering niche. The Talarian Community College, the professor who's been around forever. Shuffle Up and Play has a Season 3 Kickstarter that was immediately fully funded and immediately beat all of the stretch goals. Yeah. You can still get involved in it as of the recording of this and the posting to the Patreon. It will have 12 days left. You will have seven (laughs) for free feeds when this goes live. Uh, You can get token packs, all that kind of stuff. Uh, You're going to have a fan episode as well. They're going to accept submissions. Uh, If you want 
a little bit priority for the fan submissions to be a part of the fan episode of Shuffle Up and Play, um, you should support them on the Kickstarter. I did, because I like the token packs. You are a token fan. Yes, I am a big fan of a token. And a token. Yeah, actually. <laughs> very much so. Both of them. Uh, Sam's inclusion here. The Dungeons & Dragons stamps for Gen Con Indie, which is very cool. The U.S. Postal Service is offering specific Dungeons & Dragons themes, U.S. postage stamps that you can get uh, at Lucas Oil Stadium. If you go to Gen Con, you can also get them at the Indianapolis Main Post Office located on 125 West South Street in Indianapolis, Indiana. And you can also, it's just across the street from Lucas Oil. I don't know why you, would, why you wouldn't just fucking go there to the Gen Con Indie I don't know. convention. It's nice and cool in there. Lots of stamps. Get, you got mail to send? Probably don't use these. You should probably save them as a collectible because oh, yeah. they're probably be a collectible. More, yeah, they're much. They're probably almost assuredly be much more valuable as a collectible. You can get them at Gen Con starting August first. Also at the same time, fuck the USPS. So you know, mm. maybe don't give them any money. Who I'm knows? more of a. I'm more of a. More of a FedEx guy myself. You know what can Brown do for you? That's, That's UPS. USPS. That's UPS. That's UPS. What can USPS do for you? Fucking nothing. Lose your items, and I not regularly regularly we we here at the dungeon bros have had many a card lost oh yeah in the usps oh yeah so we're very salty so moving on to salt (laughs) there's a lot of people that don't like weebs in this world it's true i'm not one of them but we're getting round two of for the weebs Hashtag for the weebs. Round two of the Hatsune Miku Magic the Gathering Secret Lair drops. This is another six card drop for Hatsune Miku. And uh, we get a reprint of Diabolic Tutor with Hatsune Miku Arts. It's two and a black, two black, black. Search your library for a card, put it in your hand, and then shuffle. Uh, a staple. Oh my gosh. Why are you not going to let me click over? That's annoying. Let's mm-hmm. refresh the page so we can see all the other cards. Diabolic Tutor, notably, not, not as uh, as you know efficient effective as um a lot of other tutors but in, in commander it gets it into your hand which is the big one which is the and big it, one. it's it, the only problem is it's four mana at sorcery speed but yeah. still still sees play still sees plenty of play we also got court of calling reprinted x green 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 instant it has convoke and you can search your library for a creature card with mana value x or less put it onto the battlefield and then shuffle uh convoke and x you can search for any any creature card in your library pretty much put it right into play which is awesome we have Miku Child of Song, which is a Universes Beyond reprint of the Child of Alara. It is Wooberg for a 6 6 legendary creature avatar. It has trample, and whenever Miku Child of Song dies, you destroy all non land permanents and they cannot be regenerated. Border Wipe Tribe. <laughs> you know, I, I know I know when the first one came out, we were saying it's like, oh, it's too bad there's not a legend that you could you know, a legendary five color Miku that you can put all of your uh, all these Miku cards in. This was a weird choice. This was an interesting choice. I would have expected like a Jota the Unifier style thing. Yeah, that would have been interesting. Yeah, exactly. You know, instead they're like, hey, kill this, kill, kill this everything. anime girl and kill everything else. Kill, kill your, kill your waifu and she'll take out everything else. I think that's on flavor. Sure. Someone kills your waifu, everything else, gone. <laughs> Done. Except for things with indestructible. Song of Creation, uh, one green, blue, red for an enchantment. You may play an additional land on each of your turns. Whenever you cast a spell, you draw two cards. And at the beginning of your end step, you discard your hand. Interesting enchantment. I don't, I don't like discarding my hand at the end of my turn. That seems a little, seems a little much yeah. to me. But you get, you get an additional it, land drop. It's so a value know. engine. It's a value engine. If you engine. can keep repeating your stuff, if you don't need your hand... I th- like if you got things on board, they'll let you play from your graveyard. It just says whenever you cast a spell, draw two cards. Mm-hmm. So yeah, you're refilling your hand pretty quickly, and then you have to discard anything you don't use. I, I it's teamer grave stuff. Sure. Oh yeah. Okay, I'll allow it. I will allow it. Uh, Hatsune Miku Soul Ring, a one mana artifact that taps for two colorless. You know what Soul Ring is? She's holding the ring in her hand herself, and people are cheering in the background. It's for her birthday. It's something. And a land. We get the Thespians Stage. Taps for a colorless. You can also pay two and tap it. It becomes a copy of a target land, except it has this ability, which is the pay two 
tap to copy it. Mm-hmm. So Thespian Stage, obviously infamous for its uh, two card combo with the uh, with another legendary land, the Dark Depths, uh, because of how counters work and rules at entering the battlefield. Thespian Stage immediately sacrifices itself when it becomes a Dark Depths, and it gives you a twenty twenty indestructible Merit Lage token, which is pretty cool. Nothing wrong with that. Playable in modern uh, Thespian Stage, also appropriate for Hatsune Miku because she sings a lot. Yeah. That's her whole jam. That's her whole jam. She does jam. So, Hatsune Miku, Secret Lair. It's going to happen again later. That is all we have for the news and the wrap-up items of the week. We will end this episode of the Duels and Mandadorks podcast as we end every single episode, which is taking questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, and or ideas from the TikTok Live audience as well as the Patreon. You can subscribe to the Patreon for free. If you want to uh, get podcast submissions, you can do the $5 tier for early ad-free access to all of the podcasts. Uh, you also get to vote on uh, video topics for YouTube and all that kind of stuff. And uh, we might be throwing in some spell table stuff in the future, though that's not confirmed right now. You can also join us at the $15 tier uh, to get your name read at the end of the show as well. Sam, let's go to the TikTok live chat first, because the, the Patreon question is going to be a little chonk. Yes. Um, we have one. We have probably Steven is mm-hmm. asking, who is your favorite commander from Modern Horizons 3? Nadu, <laughs> the winged wisdom. You're very familiar with that sound from was was there? Was, what's your favorite pop tart? And then that's the basic bitch answer. That's a basic bitch. Oh, you want the real answer? You want the real answer? Nadu. <laughs> <laughs> no, the real the real answer is uh, Rawl Monsoon Sage. Yeah, Rawl's interesting for. Uh, for all of the 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 is it based storm shenanigans that can that can occur now, not really not really great as a commander honestly, more of a more of a modern storm thing with the ruby medallion. Mm-hmm. So he's got value in him, but it's a, it's fine value. But yeah, like legitimately, it's Nadu, <laughs> like genuinely, just because like that, it's gonna warp every format it's legal in. And yeah, that, it already is. <laughs> it, it is. It's going to be a CEDH boogeyman uh, akin to Kinnon, Bonder Prodigy. It's already throwing modern into disarray, vintage, and yeah. it's all it's all going it's all going fucking topsy turvy right now. There were so many ways they could have made that card not only just good and playable, but also but but not this excessive powerhouse that it absolutely is mm. in the value in in the value engine commander area it's beautiful it's, it's beautiful it made it made shuko playable and valuable now it's <laughs> awesome it's awesome uh also shout out to a johnny nakata pariah for boros cats yeah so i need i need a cat man i'm a cat man meow 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 i'm not uh, yeah you know scat man and all that yes all that yeah uh mine i don't know if it's my favorite but it's the one i built because i cracked him uh genku future shaper mm-hmm uh, I've done a little bobbles deck with it, bubble, bubble. Uh, just because that's I, I'm I'm in the fit process of just building everything from collection. Might make a video on that. That'd be fun. But uh, and I have a lot of there's every every set they have so many cards that are printed like just one mana crack this thing, do a card draw, do a draw. Now it's do a draw, create get a joke, get a thing, get get a thing. Are you sacrificing its children? I'm not. I could add in a skull clamp. Make some rats. You should you should run skull clamp in that. Kill the kill his babies. There's got to be plenty of things that have sacrifice a thing. As a, oh, that's probably mostly black. Though. It's a lot of black, yeah. Mm. Uh, and blue, blue white, not so much. White wants you to throw your stuff in front of other stuff, mm-hmm. and blue wants you to cast spells or artifacts. Uh, if you look through your Dominaria remastered bulk. I think there's or, or and Ravnica remastered. I feel like there's a lot of random populate things as well. Uh there's some. Yeah, there's some. I don't some know for if that's sure. necessarily worth it, Actually, but there's definitely there's a one that's an instant speed create a token or an no, instant speed populate your creatures gain indestructible. That's mm-hmm. a pretty good one. That's a good one. Uh that one's a common as well, I it think. It is, yeah. Uh it's a little bit expensive. I think it's 4 or 5 mana. It's 4 mana, I believe, yeah. Which is a lot to hold up. For instant speed protection, I dropped a bottle cap that I've been fiddling with all. What's, now I'm sad. What's very interesting is the way that this deck wants to play out, which is um, do a thing. A lot of it is play a land, 
and then crack that, you know, like a Terramorphic Expanse or Evolving Wilds, those trigger Genku. Mm -hmm. um, a, lot of, a lot of fetches. A lot of fetches. And, but it wants, basically on my turn, I want to spend about half of my mana usually to set up a board and then on everybody else's turn crack one thing or two things at a time so you know i'm kind of holding up a lot of mana anyway just to be ready for you know because you can only create each of the tokens once per turn so it's like i in, in this case i'm going for a lot for the flying the moon folk with evasion um so it's like okay on your turn i want to move folk on your turn i want to move folk on your turn i want to move folk so it's like i gotta you gotta uh, gotta play on everybody else's turn interesting our turns comrade oh 69 i don't know I mean, I imagine the communists with sixty nine. Sure, right. It's all about the hammer and sickle. Those are basically those are basically just penises. Yeah, when you sure. Think about it. Why not? Yeah, yeah. All right, episode sixty nine. So the comment, <laughs> <laughs> the question we got from our our uh, over on the Patreon where you where you can join for free to submit questions, comments, concerns, lots and ideas. We got one from Brandon. The <laughs> out of the most expensive sixty nine. Winky face cards and magic. What is your dream card other than Black Lotus to own? Because Black Lotus is by far the most expensive by like a mile. <laughs> so mile. I went to I, I looked up the top 100 most expensive Magic the Gathering cards, and then I got this article from Draftism, which we're going to look at. The they list card number 69 on the list of most expensive cards is Mana Crypt, which I find appropriate. The original printing of Mana Crypt for 174 dollars. You get a lot of interesting old cards. Yes. So we each get one. We each get one. I want to. I want to do. Uh, we can do honorable mentions as well. Black Lotus number one. It's almost fifteen thousand dollars. We can't take that one. Uh, I want to. I, I want to do an honorable mention. I think the Mox cycle, the Mox Ruby, Mox Sapphire, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Big shout out. Super valuable. Uh, easy. Easy to play. <laughs> Very oh, easy. Oh yeah. Oh, I mean every every auto Canadian, include every Canadian Highlander deck. Like my points are mox 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 and one other thing. Literally, uh, shout out to the ancestral recall time tw time walk uh, big, time twister. Big fans of the Power Nine. Yeah, um, I'm not picking anything from the Power Nine personally. All right. uh, shout out to the Mishra's Workshop, Bazaar of Baghdad, all that kind of stuff. So, what do you know? What your pick is? Now, are we picking just on cool cards that are like as a collectible, You're, or are we talking about cool? Are we the, talking about the question is, I want to play? The question is, what's your dream card other than Black Lotus to own? To own. Um, to own. <sighs> also, shout out to the original duels. <laughs> so I think there are a, a a cool. I think if I'm just going for a cool card as a collectible. Mm -hmm. as something that's just going to live probably in a frame on a wall or something like that it's going to be shaharazard ah oh, you took mine you motherfucker that's perfect i would have also picked shaharazard actually <laughs> yeah so shaharazard is this band everywhere card that says basically uh whatever you're doing stop put it aside yeah you're gonna play a new game of magic with the remaining cards in your library and whoever wins that uh, I, whoever loses that, I believe their ha life total gets halved. Yeah, that's all. And then you go back to your game of magic. And then you go back to the original one. It's magic within magic. It's yeah. hilarious. I There's see. a reason it's banned everywhere. <laughs> you know, it's one of those things where you're like, oh, I can see where they were. I, I can see what they were doing there. It's dumb. As, as a 2024 view, it's dumb. Oh, very, very dumb. Absolutely dumb. Um, well, since you picked Shaharazard, I... I I feel like I can't pick that one anymore. Well, here, I'll give you another second to think. But if we're talking about a card to play, like as a play, I would choose a Gaia's Cradle as like, if I'm going to put something yeah. in deck, it's going to be. Yeah, a I would I would card also card. I would also pick Gaia's Cradle as a card to play. <laughs> um, I think. <coughs> excuse Sorry. you. Sorry. Excuse you. Um, I like the Library of Alexandria just because it's a real place. Um Oh, God, what was the name of the set? I always forget it. Arabian Nights. Arabian Nights had a lot of interesting real-life places. Uh, Bazaar of Baghdad, Library of Alexandria. I would go with the Chains of Mephistopheles. Um, simply because the art is badass as fuck. It's insane art. Crazy. And... Uh, what it look like when I get out of bed in the morning? I hear... 
I've heard through the grapevine that drawing cards in Magic is pretty powerful. You know, I've I've heard a person or two say that from time to time. So I think uh, a really good uh, drawing cards option is pretty cool. What is the What's the effect of it? All right, here we go. Hold on. Let's let's pull it up on Scryfall so I don't have to. So I don't have to, you know, read the fucking tiny text. Chains of Mephistopheles. Chains of is probably good. Enough. I'm gonna yeah, chains of. Chains of Mephistopheles. Here we go. The Oracle text, because that's what matters it really in real is. life. It really is. Chains of Mephistopheles. One black, it is an enchantment. If a player would draw a card except the first one they draw in each of their draw steps, that player discards a card instead. If the player discards a card this way, they draw a card. If the player doesn't discard a card this way, they mill a card. So you either get to um, just continuously rummage. Pretty much. Or you got a mill. Yeah. No cards in hand, got a mill. Yeah, it fucks everybody over. Because mm -hmm. drawing a card is pretty good at magic. Milling and a card. Milling a card, also pretty good also at magic. Good magic. If you are building a deck where you want to mill your cards, mm -hmm. and you're playing in a format like CEDH, for example, where Ristic Study and Mystic Remora yeah. and Esper Sentinel and Insert Card Draw Engine here are running rampant, uh, fuck them. Because now you got to get rid of something if ever you want to draw a card. Yeah. And some of those are not May abilities, which requires you to draw a card, which requires you to discard a card. Anyway, I like it because the art is cool. Yeah. <laughs> Brandon, thank you for supporting us on Patreon. Uh, we will end now the illustrious episode 69 of the Duels and Mandorks podcast. We're at an hour and a half in, which is honestly a little bit longer than we normally have been going these days. We got we had a lot to talk about. You know, yesterday before, or two days ago, we were talking about getting ready for this episode, and we're like, man, guess we'll like wait until after the uh, Assassin's Creed uh, debut so we have something to talk about, and then they dropped all of the D&D &D stuff. And we're like, yeah. oh, 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 yay. Okay. Now we got things right. to talk about. Fantastic. Um... Duels and Mana Dorks you can find on podcast services around the globe for free. free. Every Monday at 1230, you can get it a little bit less than a week early and ad free on our Patreon for $5 a month. That is the value tier that will never go up. You can get it early and ad free Wednesdays at about 1230. About 1230. Uh, it is currently almost 1230 and we are recording the podcast on the day it goes live on the Patreon. Sorry, Brandon Vol, our $15 uh, patron. If you support us at the $15 tier, you get your name read at the end of the show. Brandon, we love you. You're wonderful. You're way too kind to us. Episode 69. 69. Nice. And I've always seen you, my lady, six and eight. Sam said he would. But, yeah. All right, well, in the meantime, <laughs> peace.